thanks for taking your time today. And uh, maybe can you start with uh, introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. So, hi, I'm Josh Gross, and um, I work at a company called Common Room, which delivers a community software that helps like community leaders, managers, DevRel to manage their communities, build engaging, highly valuable communities, which has a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, it probably needs to be defined a little bit more about what value is in a community, but I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, prior to Common Room, I worked at Splunk. So I was at an early stage startup that was acquired by Splunk. I was a principal product manager there, um, working in distributed tracing, which is in the observability sector. And if you're familiar with observability, one of the things that I noticed while working at Splunk was that um, it was a observability was a nascent market where there are companies out there that were building communities first prior to actually delivering a, say, GA product. And what happened was these companies that had communities, they were not only like controlling the narrative of the market, but also creating this moat of ambassadors and evangelists that helped them survive uh, much longer than you would have been able to do on product and go to market alone. And so at that point, I noticed that they were had an advantage in the market that it was very difficult to compete with at times. And so prior to that, I had also been in enterprise sales, um, working with open source communities, as well as building startups um, in a community first fashion. And so I've always seen how community has uh, has influenced buying decisions, brand advocacy. And so by now I was just like, you know, what? I have to get into the space because I don't think you can win without community. And so, um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and, and what I'm doing. Oh, that's great. Can you tell me a little bit about the common room, uh, what it is and more details on that? Yeah, so uh, I'll describe it by, I guess, explaining the challenges in community. So um, in community, how I'm defining community is it's going to be your online and offline engagements with prospects, users that are interested in your company or your products. Um, and now Common Room, however, like we're not necessarily just catering to business to business companies. It does seem to uh, resonate the most with them because of the, I would say the investment into communities higher. And there's so many stakeholders within every company that want access to the users within the community because they want access to users. Um, and so what Common Room does is we help community leaders, managers, DevRel to be able to not only take all of these disparate channels of information where community is taking place. So you might have like your bevy, your meetup, you'll have your Twitter, you'll have your GitHub, um, YouTube channels, Slack or Discord. And we bring all of that content and context together we not only take all those members or users and help tie them together, because if you're in Stack Overflow, you may be anonymous. Um, but we're, what we're trying to do is make the conversations more visible. Then once we have these conversations in here in these members, then we help you understand which organization do they work for? Um, what is the sentiment that they have towards your organization? Who within your organization are they working with most? Because one of the challenges is, especially as we're seeing community grow so quickly, is more and more folks are getting higher into DevRel and to community, but how do you really get context of what your community looks like? Um, who's in it? Uh, who's contributing the most? What the value of community is to your business? So you can think like, if all these interactions are taking place, we have high engagement, it's great, but what does that mean for our business? And you need to really tie that to your systems of record, like your CRM, your support desks, um, other external data sources to be able to bridge that. And what we're seeing for our customers early on is that those community leaders that are sh sharing that information and combining that and thinking about the business outcomes, which usually are tied to like revenue, but there are other some more tactical ones as well. They're the ones that are getting a seat at the table and they're driving change and they're driving a, I would say like a community first, customer first culture change within a lot of these companies. So it's really, really exciting. Yeah, it is definitely. Can you tell me like why it's important for product building products more focused on community? Like what, what happens if somebody don't care about community today and yeah. they ship, sell, sell things and don't listen to community? Like why it's such an important thing, the product, anyone building products should take care of community. Yeah, so uh, coming from like just being a product manager at Splunk, uh, here are the challenges that I had. 
Um, number one was which customers do like which customers should I be talking to? Because what happens is, especially as your your organization grows, like each individual like pillar within your company, so if it's marketing or product or so forth, gets further and further away from the customer because it's just too hard to get visibility into all the interactions that are happening. And so what ends up happening is you go up the path of least resistance. So you end up talking to the same customers over and over, which they may be great but you're not getting those additional lenses um, that become really important. Plus like when you're like tactically um, from a product perspective, the, like some of the programs that you may run or at least be heavily involved in are gonna be like customer advisory boards, beta testing of products. So how do you find the customers that should be influential in your roadmaps? How do you find those customers that are ready for beta testing and qualified for it? How do you start to define like segmentation of your users at a higher degree as your products get more complex. And so just by being in the community and having access to understand who's in your community, what they're talking about, it, it like opens up all of these new channels of insights. Now, when you're early on in a company, um, like I've seen communities be developed prior to products, because what happens is if you can get or mobilize a bunch of users that are interested in the same problem space as you, they're gonna help you early on as you define the product that you're going to build. And like, it becomes so important when you think about like minimum viable products, what do we deliver first? What are those first end-to-end -end workflows? Like if you're working directly with your potential users, you're gonna avoid a lot of missteps. So like product, it's, uh, I would say it's one of the most critical beneficiaries of, of community. Yeah, I think I can totally align with what you said, especially when you have a different segments for a product and mm -hmm. you talk to the same person, but they're not maybe the beginners. They might be sometimes advanced uh, users, use cases. How do you provide a documentation for them? How do you address them different segments? Uh, uh, that, that also makes sense. And also you talked about uh, as you have more layers, uh, customer mm -hmm. success, sales, and the touch points between the product team and the touch point, the customer facing team, it gets the more layers you have, the hard it is to get the community feedback, the customer feedback, and it, it, yeah. it makes you hard to make decision and you go on to do a lot of assumptions and you don't know if it's the right thing to do or not. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm never like more uncomfortable when I'm making a product decision based on an intuition alone. Mm -hmm. um, because you know that like, you just don't have the right context that you need to to make the best decision for the product for the customer for the company and so absolutely that feedback is critical plus like the other thing about feedback from community so say like twitter twitter's not it's it does it can carry some good signal um especially like with how users complain and so forth but understanding who is it in twitter that is complaining about which product and do are they tied to our organization? Do we have revenue associated with them and so forth? Like you can imagine, like you're gonna change how you respond, how you react with all that context, and you're going to resonate, be more relevant when you do engage. Absolutely. Do you have uh, any example you talked about? Uh, you start community even before building a product. So that's kind of yeah. a building community is your first MVP. Do you have any such examples where you see, hey, these are the things I've seen People are doing that. They're building a product, uh, community first, and then building a product. Any examples you want to share? Yeah. I well, I'd say like <clears throat> so. At my first startup, um, it was a company in the software-defined networking space, and what we did was um, um, we were building essentially like an always-on VPN, so you could connect to. This was early days in AWS, so there were some gaps from a product market fit. But prior to that, what we did was we engaged with who was our target buyer going to be, and we found a like a small small medium sized business IT community. Um, and so what we started to do was we started to go into their forums and understand like what are the challenges that users have with um, remote connectivity, with user management. Uh, this was right around like SD WAN. Then we had like zero trust. It was probably before zero trust came out. And so I uh, performed this function of like a customer advocate in there. And so I would answer any questions around VPN, around um, connectivity, some of the challenges. So I'd help them troubleshoot in certain areas. And then what would end up happening was these users were interested, well, what is Pertino? Oh, my company was called Pertino. What does Pertino do? 
And so what ended up happening was um, all of that goodwill and that value that we were bringing out prior to actually asking for anything. What it did was it brought, we ended up with a wait list of like 1300 users that were interested in our product before we even shipped. Mm. And so for that, it was more around creating like brand and advocacy and an understanding of like, this is the space that we're in. Um, other areas that I've seen, like taking observability um, as an example is so like observability, um, you like you can debate when the topic kind of arose, but it, essentially uh, there were conversations going on around observability and the idea of being able to understand based on the signals that your system produces, being able to understand what's going on. Um, and so a lot of like thought leaders and or they weren't thought leaders at the time, but people became thought leaders um, by talking and giving um, giving talks at like SRECon and different conferences. And so what they did was they bridged that into say a Slack channel and then workshops around observability and this and that. And then eventually, usually what I see happen, especially in chat is you have say the introduction. So you fear everybody talks to each other, then you have learning and you have resources and all of these different pieces that, um, that people can just have conversations around. And by the time your product's ready, then you're introducing a new challenge uh, channel around the product. Um, and by then you have this vibrant community of people that are learning from each other and interacting and identifying with each other. And now you introduce this product and naturally folks want to come over to it because they believe that this whole conversation that has taken place for so long has fed into what this company is going to deliver. And so there's that inherent trust, um, inherent credibility. And by then you already have say like the jargon associated with the space. Like you've done so much to create this like miniature moat and shared understanding that wasn't there previously. And so community uh, it, it, it creates people to people relationships, it allows you to get the insights you need, test messaging, everything. And by the, if you do that well, and you have like a, a very sustainable, high value community where people are interacting, helping, trusting each other, then by the time you deliver a product, it's a natural onboarding. Um, and people are willing to give through altruistic measures like beta testing, um, advocacy, quotes, et cetera, even if they haven't even touched the product yet. It's amazing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I worked for Atlassian Forge, uh, kind of a beta user. I was uh -huh. part of the Slack. And before even launching the product, yeah. they tested and they got so much feedback from the community, which otherwise it was hard for them. Yeah. And the, the amount of information, feedback, getting their users for participation of research mm -hmm. and validating their ideas and getting more ideas for the product uh, I think the community is like a great uh, resource for them. So they yeah. don't have to hunt for asking for a participant for the research. It made them so much sense. And also I look back at Stripe, looking at their mm -hmm. documentation, looking at the product and how much they learn, get from the community. And yeah. I also saw one of the video from the CDO. Like the CDO was saying that the most of the innovation happens are coming from the customer signal, like customer feedback. Yeah. Like we continually talking to them and we see what the struggle is today at them. And that's how we invent the things. Um, so that, that, that really makes sense. Uh, uh, one, one of the common challenge I see is um, from, the, from the product leaders, uh, from the companies who are not yet seeing the value of community, they always mm -hmm. think about like, hey, uh, we don't have a dedicated person to uh, do a developer, a developer advocate or a customer mm -hmm. advocate. Uh, it's a too much of effort for a, product manager or a product person to, or engineer because we hired for them to do the engineering tasks, not the community thing. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you take on a impact of a community to the product? How do you measure an impact of a community to the product? So that's a, a great question. I wanna make two comments prior to get into uh, the impact because I think the impact, how you measure it is based on the life cycle that your company is in. And so you're going to have different goals at different times. But uh, first off with Atlassian, like that was a great example. Stripe is a great example. When you think about like Atlassian and the number of customers they have and the ways that they engage with their users, like the, there's so many interactions happening on a daily basis that it becomes noisy. 
Um, and it's like, how do you filter through all that to find those betas? And so that I like, I wanted to get back to that just briefly because like when you've reached that like pinnacle of success in a community, now you do have the resources to sustain it. You may have 50 dev developer advocates working uh, across the globe, regionally, everybody knows what they're doing, but that's still such a high volume of interactions that it's actually hard to filter and get that feedback and everything. And so that's why tools like Common Room are being developed today is like that helps to filter there. Um, the other thing that I would say is like on the the value of community, or uh, you also mentioned that nobody's owning um, community, especially early on. Uh, interestingly, like coming from sales, I've been the first sales hire multiple times um, at early, early, like pre-revenue startups. Um, and the executive teams that you work with, they're just like, okay, we need sales. And you're like, well, why do you need sales? Most of the time they don't have product market fit and everything, but they believe they need sales because every company has sales other than like Atlassian started without sales. But, um, but like, so there, it, there is this point in time where people believe these are the things you need to be successful. I think that time is going to come for community. It's just getting to your question around what is the impact of community. People haven't been able to articulate or understand it directly, like draw a direct line between community and business. You see it when you see it, or you know it when you know it, but it's like, it's not completely clear. And that is the big problem in this space today is there haven't been easy ways for you to draw those lines. And so you see some like, very forward um, leaning like community leaders, uh, some that we're working with, like they're, they're measuring success by like lead attribution. So did this organization and did these users join the community before they entered the product? And then what happened after that? And so just figuring out which organizations are in your community versus within your company and what is, the, what is that journey they took, um, that helps you to understand like, kind of understand like what is that ideal path that a customer may take to get into your product and then what are the the items of value that we can deliver along the way so I'm not talking about like extrinsic uh, items at all I'm what I'm talking about is like when a user is here what do they need and what do they expect and how do we continue to build trust and enable them to get closer to their goals and so um, one measurement of impact could be like lead attribution. That's something that marketing, like marketing today is reaching out into figuring out like, I wanna find a user that is kind of interested in the space that's somewhat related to what we do so I can advertise to them. Like, I'm sorry, but if you're reaching that far out and you haven't figured out like, hey, these people are already interested in our community, but because it's hard to figure out who's in our community and stuff, like we're just gonna like ignore those. Like that's a mistake. That is like a very low signal in the amount of nurturing you have to do, plus finding like an impending event or something that um, has to change in their environment. Um, it's just it's just silly. And so when we think about when we think about uh, measuring the impact of community, like if you're early on in your community ideation creation strategy, then a lot of it is going to be around like some of what become vanity metrics later on. It's just growth, like. Am I recruiting the right people and are they coming into it? Then it ends up being like engagement. Like how often are they um, interacting with each other? Um, then it becomes stuff like user generated content. Are people writing about us? Or are they creating content that not only serves as like case studies quotes, but also marketing materials. Then they become speakers potentially on behalf of the company at our events. Um, and so then you're starting to enable or help the like a lines of business achieve what their OKRs, objective key results might be your goals. Um, what we're seeing now is like, as you start to tie stuff like into, from like Snowflake or some of these others um, systems record, now you can start to see like customer health. So like from a customer success standpoint, like here's the customer, here's what we know about them from a um, subscription, uh, maybe even product usage if you're that uh, advanced. Now, what do they look like from the community? Well, what you'll find is you'll have these strategic customers and especially in the open source world where they actually have a lot more users in the community than you know of. Um, and so what ends up happening is these community users are having conversations. They're maybe filing issues in GitHub. They may be um, working in your forums, like your discourse, 
Um, and there's no relation. Nobody, like the people that are looking and working with those folks in your CRM have no idea what's happening over here. And that disconnect, not only it creates risk, but it also produces opportunity to say, well, if we have all these users over here and they have questions, then they don't even know the support channels. Um, how can we link these folks to these folks to create like centers of excellence, to do workshops? And if there are so many people here um, at this company, what if we connected with other companies that work with us too? And now you start to see like how you're fostering something much bigger than a product relationship alone. Yeah, that's 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 a great, really great, great answer. Adding to that, um, you, you you talked about in one of your tweet about reduce the the time for feedback from community to company. Yeah. Uh, can, can you maybe talk a little bit on that, please? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple layers there. Um, one is like, it's like a pitch for what we're building because like that is a challenge that DevRel faces that community leaders face. But let, like, if we just look at the problem, like, so today, if you are a small company where no one owns community, so maybe it's like open source, your founders are in there every day. You've got like product folks, you might have engineers just checking. And so you might have like three, I don't know, three questions in Stack Overflow over a week. But you have users that are checking all of these different channels to find this information because they like they care about responsiveness, which is something we think is really important to measure as well because responsiveness shows care and attention. And it also means that like activity is another good signal for users coming into a community. But uh, so one of the challenges with feedback is just figuring out where conversations are happening and filtering that. Um, now the filtering piece, so say you're a little bit beyond that where you actually have a dedicated DevRel or community leader, what they're doing is they're taking all these interactions that are happening and they are distilling what is being said and routing it to individuals. So you already have this game of telephone and it's usually happening in a reactive way um, in an ad hoc. So it's interrupt driven, meaning like they may be keeping it on like a Google Sheets and then sending it out, or they may just be slacking Discord, whatever, emailing it to the associated parties. But it's like, it's just a mess. You don't have any idea of like prioritization. Um, some are going to be bugs. Others are going to be feature requests, which happens anyways in life. Uh, is it a bug or a feature request? But uh, you can see how it's just become so fragmented. And then for some of these companies, like you mentioned, like an Atlassian or Stripe, the volume is just uh, incredible. Um, and so, uh, you could go the route of saying, okay, like um, let's put a process in place um, where we're capturing all of these nodes, we're creating tabs, maybe in a Google Sheet or something like that, or Airtable, um, whatever you want to use. And then we're assigning, like, and that works for a while. Um, but what we've developed, and I think is like going to be a game changer because of the uh, dearth of resources and community leadership, like, in DevRel, like everybody, like the job boards are insane here, um, is we're actually using a little like natural language processing and um, machine learning. And what we're doing is we're categorizing for you. So essentially when a conversation comes in, we're not only assessing like, is there sentiment? Meaning like, is there a positive vibe or a negative vibe in it? But also is this a product question? Is this product appreciation? Is this a bug or issue? Um, and so what that allows you to do is create these filters. That means that like I can create a filter view. And so like, here's a great example. One of our customers, they just had a, they shipped a brand new product and um, at one of their big events. And so what we do is we'll filter by that product name. So, and then we filter by product appreciation. So for product and engineering teams, now they can see like all the positive conversations and marketing as well all the positive conversations that are happening around this specific launch and what people are excited about. That's important, like from a cultural standpoint, but it's also important because now it's like, okay, well, if we're going into beta, these ones could be the one, these could be the users that we interact with. And then if it's in like a high intense, um, say channel, such as like, maybe it's a Slack that you have to register for or something like that versus like social media, then that tells me something else. Or if it's in GitHub, like on a comment, like those are those are the people that I want to interact with immediately. And so um, for us, um, this is a problem we're directly trying to solve via like using technology that's 
um, that we've developed as well as like working with open AI and great, great technologies like that. Um, but, uh, but this is like the value of the community. Um, and so if you don't nail this, then all of that interaction that's happening, you're not benefiting from. And so how do, how do we filter that? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, I think another point you talked about was uh, personalization because we have a different user segments. Um, yeah. can, can you talk about more on the personalization? How can we address the personalization community? Uh, yeah, uh, so um, I have two lenses on this. One is like coming from sales and working with highly technical individuals. Like a few years ago, I was working um, at a company called EMC. We had been acquired by Dell and I was just working with Apple. And because it's been enough years, I can talk about it now. <laughs> and one of the challenges with Apple was they didn't, they would spend a lot of money with us, but they wouldn't meet with us because they knew the technology. They were all very, very sharp. Um, and so I couldn't get meetings with them about anything. And fortunately at that time, like there was Mesos and Kubernetes. And so what I needed to do to get these meetings was I need to figure out like who was working on container projects and what were some of the challenges that I could uncover with say a Mesos versus a Kubernetes? What are the opportunities there that they may not have discovered themselves yet? And then who are the experts that I can connect them with with our organization? Um, and so what I did was at the time, uh, one of my good friends now, Josh Bernstein was leading up EMC code. It was open source, building a way for you to connect to stateful storage from your containerized, uh, your, well, your orchestrator. And so this was an area like all the apps that were written in containers at the time were mostly like stateless, but anything that was important needed to maintain state. And so what I was able to do was by finding these individuals, I could create this narrative around, hey, like you're starting to develop more and more containers, like here are the problems that we're starting to see. And this is why we're working on these open source projects. And then what that did was it allowed us to get these like work workshops together um, around like around application development and storage. And from there, it ties back to, oh yeah, our storage is actually the built with this in mind, which nothing else was at the time. And so um, that's how you can provide value that's personalized from like, so now you can imagine like, that's a really, really hard job to do, especially at scale. So when you think about segmentation now, um, usually you have marketing segmentation, which is something that like most of the company just needs to understand, like who is Sue, who is Dennis, Johan, and what is, what's important to them? What are the pains that they have? Like, how do they make decisions? But that there, you might have like three or four or five personas because anything beyond that, it's no longer even actionable. But at the community level, like you have folks that are in GitHub filing issues, doing pull requests. You have folks that are in Slack talking about this. You have folks that are in Discord. Um, that are answering questions or talking specifically about features and like, or in Stack Overflow, they only work on these languages and they're in these regions. Um, and so all of a sudden your segmentation, like can, you can get to that, like, like that smallest granularity of understanding of these users and you can target them with things that are valuable to them. Additionally, you have the signal of like when somebody enters your community, maybe they join your Slack or maybe they make a comment or, um, star github whatever uh, repo whatever um like what is it that you start to learn about folks that are doing that that you can add value immediately like hey if you're new to the community here are some resources for you or hey this organization that's been using our product for a long time is giving a talk about how they got started you can join it so it's just that personalization becomes much easier because you have more context it's not just software engineer at this company um, which you never know if they're back end, front end. And even if you know they're back end, like they could be doing so many different things here. It's like, there's this intent that they put into the interactions that now you can actually act upon. That's great. That's great. Uh, so you can have an onboarding specific based on the context there, where they're coming from. So you yeah. can navigate them so that they're going to have a happy path and they're going to stick with the product and they get, get their job done quickly instead of they're figuring it out. Yeah, like people like usually like with developers, uh, many that I've worked with, like they want to do it on their own, but the getting into like developer experience, it's really hard to know how to help them do it on their own and what to give them at what point in time here, since you're already monitoring like all of your channels of interactions anyways, 
like now you, you can start to figure out also like what should we be creating to help folks at this stage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah uh, that makes sense uh, what about uh, do you see any trends uh, in the new startups or new companies which are coming up recently uh, for example one example i want to give you is like cypress like cypress is an automation uh, testing tool they have a free free open source uh, project mm -hmm. to try out but they also yeah. have a, a paid one which is like for dashboard to run it on a cloud um mm -hmm. I've, I've, se I've seen similar products several products they offer yeah. a basic version for free for developers to play around they have a yeah. community around it in addition they have like hey if you want to use the advanced feature if you want to scale around it buy mm -hmm. our product uh like yeah. scale it i so uh, do you see any kind of a trend uh, in this uh developer community and the product innovations uh space here yeah and it sounds to me like you're referring to like a, a lot of companies that are especially doing like open source portions as well um and uh recently i gave a, a talk internally at common room to some of my like colleagues around like what's unique about open source communities versus like a product centric community or proprietary software and um and now we're actually starting to talk to a lot of growth leads at these companies because their whole goal is to say okay we have this groundswell, like a lot of folks are using our open source. We don't necessarily know who it is, but how do we motivate them to try the say trial product to convert to paid? And like, what's different about the folks that go to paid versus the ones that are on free? And like, these are really, really hard questions to solve, especially if you don't know what these users look like. And that's where the, like the segmentation comes in as well. Um, and so what we're finding is that if you can marry, say, like organizations that are in your open source, so say I'm uh, Cyprus and I'm in an open source community and then I'm Cyprus, but I'm also a paid customer. So for larger, like if you're targeting like these enterprise level that have many, many developers, now you can start to see what are the, do these users know these users? And you can actually start to connect the dots for them. Um, and that that's what helps you to build really large like relationships, both via revenue, but also strategic interests, customer advisory boards and so forth. It's just connecting the dots in these very large organizations. And like that in itself is a, a like a great value of marrying the two together. Um, now, in terms of getting folks from your free open source to paid, now just starting to understand the conversations that occur and really having a good understanding, like HashiCorp does as well, of like, what are the signals or what are the things that a customer needs to, to be qualified or to be appropriate for our paid? And then what happens is if you're seeing that, like, we're just not finding and having the right conversations in open source to get people into our paid, then what should we be, like, how should we modify our product? And so just like, again, like the, that gets back to your feedback, um, but it's like right now, everybody is blind to what's happening in open source and the relationship between what folks do in open source versus what they do in the paid environment. And so by bridging those two environments and helping you to see who's doing what and what is like the journey that one goes from here to here, now you can start to recreate or influence how that journey takes place. Um, based on the content that you deliver, the engagement, the product that you develop, all of that. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, is there any advice you want to give somebody who wants to start a community? Like they know they have a product or yeah. they want to have an idea, but they want to start a community. Uh, do you want to give some kind of advice or tips? Like, hey, this is the way I would going to build a community around it. Yeah, uh, so the, so it depends, like, now when you have like web three you have creator community you have all these different things the first thing that i do whenever i'm looking at like should i start a community because personally like i i know a lot about startup sales should i be starting a community or should i join an existing community like um what is the what is that voice that i have or that value that i can deliver in a community that's going to be different than they can get anywhere else and maybe it's not you just have to deliver about better that's fine too but so the first thing you want to like identify is like, what is the value that users are going to get and who are, what do these users look like? And so clearly like you need content, you need engaging conversations, you need all of those interactions, opportunities to network and meet in different 
mediums, channels, but really it's about like defining like what is the value that folks are going to get and why am I uniquely positioned or knowledgeable on the subject to deliver on that? And then who needs to be a part of this to continue to develop and add more value for every member that comes in? Um, then of course you have like all the stuff around like the tactical around guidelines, like welcome bots, all that kind of stuff, and blah, 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 blah. But it's really like, if you don't have an identity, then people aren't going to know what they're there for. And so I would say, number one, it's like, if like uh, a company, like here, an example would be like the open policy agent, which does like security um, within the CNCF. Like for them, it's like, okay, anybody that needs to like manage security and permissions at scale in a containerized environment is going to run into these issues. And we understand this better than anybody else. So we're going to teach them about that. Perfect. Like, okay, so let's go into that and like, let's bring the right folks in that also care about this topic. And then we're going to develop a product around it and so forth. But it's really just being able to like articulate and then generate con content, invite, or like motivate the right folks to engage. Um, and then from there, like it's just feeding it, feeding it, experimenting with channels, ways to attract new and different types of members. Um, and then like kind of <laughs> the rest isn't history. It, it takes a lot of intent, um, but uh, you can't start without that. Yeah, I, I, when, when you were explaining, I was thinking about one of the uh, UX uh, strategist uh, Jared Spool, and he mm -hmm. started a new community like a couple last year. So he has yeah. a very expert in UX, and he started his own community and he's sh uh, sharing his knowledge on the UX and teaching around it. So building community around it. So yeah, to to totally makes sense. Um, my my last question is: uh, Is there any blogs or social media you follow where to keep up to date on the community? on things. Yeah. Uh, so when I got into the space, I wanted to like institutionalize my knowledge versus it's like in the community, so much is anecdotal. Like this was my experience or this is what I saw. This is the story I heard. And so um, some of the books that I had picked up were like Mary Thingball, um, Business Value of Developer Relationships. It's phenomenal. It's mm -hmm. a couple of years old. We actually did a Q&A with her at Common Room. Um, <clears throat> David Spinks, like Business of Belonging. Um, there's Fever B uh, Consulting out of the UK. Uh, they have like a daily blog that's actionable um, as well. Uh, that's phenomenal. There's like, there's so much good stuff. It's just, it's still the market for community and um, respecting community leadership at the executive level. It hasn't evolved to that yet, but it should. And so, um, I'm, I would imagine there's going to be so much more content written in the next couple of years um, as well. But uh, there's other great podcasts like In Before the Lock is one I enjoy. Um, Community Pulse is good. Um, and then Twitter, like there's a lot of great personalities that are learning in public. Um, and that's how you and I met. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's right, Josh. And I really enjoyed our talk. And thanks a lot uh, for sharing your knowledge on the community.